Spread the fire and welcome to SMWX. I think this might be the most fiery episode yet. I am joined by Gauteng's premier candidate, one of the rising stars across South Africa's political landscape, an all round interesting and incredible politician, uh, Mr. Salim Simanga. Dade, thanks so much for coming. Thank you very much, and thank you for having me in, uh, in your studios. Thanks so much for, for being here. And, you know, we really care about young people, yeah. about including the youth, especially in this election. Yeah, yeah. And so I wanted to ask you straight off the bat, why do you think the DA is the right choice, not just for any South African, but particularly for a young South African, maybe even a first time voter yeah. who's looking at this election this year? Well, you know, young people have been asking me that particular question and have been asking me, tell me how we're moving forward. And that is what is key um, from the DA. We are focused on moving South Africa forward. We are focused on getting young people, um, you know, a brighter future. And I think the first thing that we need to be talking about is how do we ensure that, uh, you know, as young people, the level of education or the quality of education is that of a, of a, of a, of a, of a good, um, of a good uh, quality? Mm. The second thing is how do we ensure that young people are not going to be overburdened going forward um, in terms of paying for the sins of the past? I tell you right now, South Africa is borrowing 1.2 million rand a day. 1.2 million rand a day. And it's costing us a billion rand a day to service that particular debt. So you can think as a young person. So now you're going to go, you now need to start, start a family. You want to, you know, buy a car. You want to, um, you know, buy a house or, you know, an apartment or something like that. You're already burdened. You're already now are taxed to death. We want to then say, let's make sure that more and more young people have money in their pockets so we, that we can we get the that? economy going. So how we're saying is that, first of all, let's start with the, with, with the education system. Hmm. We are putting so much money into the education system in South Africa. And in fact, of all the uh, developing countries, we are putting more than any other country. But the quality that, uh, or the output that you get is actually not even anywhere near the amount of money that we're putting in. Agreed. So we're saying, let's make sure that our young people that are leaving the foundation phase, your preschool and your, your, your primary school mm. level, A, have an, a pure understanding or good understanding of maths, um, reading and writing. That is very much important. And so that we are able to then keep much more than we are keeping or retaining them in the schooling system. And because that is the problem. Yeah. I mean, we have a million um, children that are starting school, but only half will be able to then come at the end. That is a problem. And do you think that the, the, the major problem there is teachers? Is it infrastructure? What do you think specifically needs to change when we, when we think about questions of education? Well, let's see. Let's contrast this against uh, what is happening in Kenya. Okay. So, per, let, let me look at uh, if you had uh, a thousand computers in a school in, in, in South Africa, in Kenya you would have 400. But you have more advanced um, IT um, uh, 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 students that will be coming from Kenya as an example. Mm. So, I don't think the issue is um, more of the infrastructure. Yes, we have a, a huge backlog when it comes to infrastructure. But I think the biggest challenge that we're sitting with is not having proper management in terms of the schooling I system. See, right. I grew up um, where, well, I'm not as that old, but uh, yeah, <laughs> when I grew up, I mean, so. um, we had inspectors at school. That is gone. We had, uh, you know, inspectors would, that would come into school, check on random, um, you know, on things, on random things, how the learners are coping in, term, in, in a class, how and the teachers are actually then doing, um, and, and if there's a recommendation to be done in terms of getting teachers to be retrained um, or, or recapacitated, then that needs to take place. Sure. That is gone. In fact, now the unions are running the schools instead of government running the schools, and I think that's where the problem is. Right. So we need to make sure that we have, you know, um, the government doing what government needs to do, and that is making sure that we have adequately trained teachers in school there on time and not drunk. I've been shocked to go into certain areas where you're told in that school teachers arrive drunk mm. and you can't do anything to them because they are protected by unions. That is not conducive so for a learning environment. It's really so the administration of the education department. That, that's what we now need sure. to do. And also I think as a society, and I'm talking now, um, broader, because I think members of the society also needs to play a part. Mm. You know, um, you know, teachers are now also saying, look, I mean, we are now um, coming in, we want to teach. 
we want to offer the skill that we know and we have and we want to impart it. But at the same time, you have unruly kids that are coming to school. You call on parents to come and, uh, you know, and, and, and discipline the children and you get less at by the parents. Mm. So where do we draw the line to say, as parents will play our part, as teachers and the education system will play our part, but also learners need to come in and play their part and understand that you are there as an empty cup. If you, if you come to school with an understanding that you're in an empty cup, then you will be filled. But okay. if you come thinking that you are already full, mm. Mm. then what are you doing there? You're just going to waste everybody's time. And, um, you know, as the Chinese proverb says, I mean, you can't fill a, 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 a filled cup. So you, it's, 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 it's that understanding of, uh, you know, putting all the three um, legs together. Okay. And then we now need to be able to then move from there. And let's, let's talk about the university sector as well, yeah. because you've spoken about the, the, the early center, and yeah. the foundation phase, which I agree is absolutely yeah. crucial. But I would say over the last five years, one of the biggest questions that has been posed to our society is, what do we do with the university sector? Actually, just the whole po post-school yeah. sector. Yeah. How do we make sure that education is able to be accessed yeah. financially, but also that the sector produces the kinds of South Africans that we want to take this next generation forward? I think something that is missing in the South African um, dialogue right now is to say what kind of uh, economy we want to be driving. Now, if you know what kind of economy you want to be driving, then you will be biased towards educating people in that particular way, right? So I think we now need to be investing much more in terms of where we want to. People are talking about the fourth industrial revolution, mm. but we're not really identifying where does South Africa fit into that gap. Yeah. And how are we then preparing learners and how incentivizing those that can impart that skill to be then, you know, at the center stage and actually making sure that we have enough so that when the numbers are coming from, you know, from schools, from, from your, your, let me call your primary um, um, schooling in, into the tertiary schooling, that you are able to then attract that kind of uh, um, um, talent. I think the important thing is this here. We need to then say, at a school level right now, it's not everybody who wants to get a degree. Let us look at um, making sure that we build more technical high schools and technical colleges than what we have. And they should be accessible. That's number one. Number two, let us make sure that we introduce some of these technological um, courses much earlier than leaving it to, you know, when somebody gets to um, right. university or to a technicon or to a mm. college. But another important aspect is this. We are now, uh, you know, having um, kids that are pushed from school, early in school, you know, pushed through, that by the time they get to university, they're so frustrated that they drop out. Mm. Now we need to make sure that you're able to then lay a solid foundation so that kids who decide to go to universities, kids that decide to go to a technicon, have a very firm foundation from which to be able to then build from. What, what That's how you're able to then ensure that you break that. But let's talk about the financing yeah. thereof. Do you, you, do you think free education is a good idea or do you think we should run some different system? Can you take us through how your party differs from what's, what's being done now, essentially? Well, I, I don't think that South Africa can afford a completely free education system. I think we should be able to then say those that can pay should pay and then should pay enough to be able to then also help in subsidizing those that cannot pay. I don't think anybody should be denied a, a chance for education. But yet at the same time, if you're going to say free for all, I promise you it's not going to be sustainable. Um, you are going to have a situation where you're going to run out of money. As I said, South Africa is already living beyond its means as things are. We are already, you know, uh, borrowing, as I said, 1.2 billion. It's not bad words. Go and look at uh, Tito Mboweni's speech um, when he delivered his uh, budget speech. He did say that we are borrowing 1.2 billion rent, um, you know, a day. So that tells you we're already living beyond our means. Now, if we're not able to curtail this, we're going to be finding ourselves in some serious problem. But here's something that I think South Africa also needs to have a chat about. You know, one thing I've done is to contrast what uh, the African nation did um, when they got their independence uh, from, from, the, uh, from, from, from the, the, the English, if you like. What they did was that they mimicked or they built institutions and they made sure that Africans will be the only African language that you can get a child from preschool up to a professor level learning in Africans. Mm -hmm. What did we do? Now we're talking about Africans must fall, you know, this language must fall. Instead of saying, how do we get other indigenous languages 
to be taught in university level and to even incentivize people that are able to teach in those languages. What we're now saying is let's kill that which works instead of promoting and actually that developing that which hasn't been able to work. And that's where I think young people should be asking, what is government doing mm. to make sure that a child can go from preschool up to a doctor level learning in Zulu okay. if they so wish? So I, I think I, I think I agree with you that it's it's crucial that we put more resources behind what are sometimes called indigenous African languages and that yeah. they, they should be able to be pursued all the way through the education yeah. system. But when we come back to the question of the financing of higher education, yeah. my understanding is that the current system is already means tested so that it's only the National Student Financial Aid Scheme students right now right. who are given free education. So would you continue that policy or would you think that that some kind of difference should be, should be, or, or do you think that maybe more students or less students should be on this fast? Well, I can tell you though that it could be more students. Okay. But there's corruption that is taking place into the NESFAS right now. Mm -hmm. So that's, this is robbing other learners who should be benefiting out of this. Right. It's keeping them out, and it's keeping those that are already into the system suffering every time, where monies are not paid on time to do what needs to be done. Sure. But also there needs to be a proper monitoring of the administrators of uh, the, 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 right. the NESFAS. Right. And I think if we're able to do that, you realize that you can actually put much more. Mm. And there needs to be a more stricter uh, um, uh, control in terms of who gets to benefit. I can tell you right now there are people who don't even qualify, who come from well-off families, but because they are able to then wiggle their way through the process, they are able to then get into that. While leaving somebody who's coming from Matatiel, who is in real need of an education system, who is living with a grandmother now, who cannot even afford to pay for that child to get into a bus to get to a university. So, so that is something that we now need to make sure that we we are very, very careful about. And if we're not going to be able to do that, I promise you we're going to just have more and more students coming through, sure. but we're going to have um, less and less money that uh, you know will be available. Sure, and, and I guess that's similar to your earlier point about ensuring that the administration of higher education, the administration of basic education, yeah. and even early childhood development, we need people within those posts who are capable, who are not going to fall victim yeah. to corruption. So I, I wanted to ask you, because I think one of the signature victories that you claim to have scored um, in your time in Tswane was turning the financial um, picture yeah. around. Um, yeah. And your claim is that you, you inherited a two billion deficit yeah. and you turned that into a surplus. Talk us through why you think financial management is important. Talk us through how that happened mm. and and how that links to questions of management in all spheres of our state. All right, it's just it, it's gone beyond a claim now. If you if you look at Africa Check, which okay. is a credible institution, sure. have sure. actually gone into that, have gone through the books, have gone in through the history and actually verified that what I was sure. saying was actually true. Mm. That's number one. Number two is that uh, when we got in, the city was technically bankrupt. It had two billion rand deficit. Mm. Now, two billion rand deficit, and you're sitting with over 107 billion rand of um, infrastructure backlog. Sure. Now, when we got in, one of the other issues that we inherited was that the, the, the previous administration had decided to sell all the vehicles of the municipality. Hmm. And we're renting vehicles um, you know, from tender premiers mm. at four times what it would have actually cost us if we were owning the vehicles. Mm. So that tells you that if you don't have a, a tighter control of your your finances you are going to bleed and you're not going to be able to then move forward i'll give you an example so in one year we move from a a two billion rand to a two billion rand deficit to a 704 million rand operating surplus how we're able to do that is that we started identifying where money was actually leaving that we were not getting value we were paying as, as an example a company five million rand a day 5 million rand a day for 12,000 dumb meters. They used to call them smart meters, but there was nothing smart about them. <laughs> they were dumb meters. Mm. We then started plugging holes in that. In the mayor's office, as an example, there were nine, over 916 people that were hired in the mayor's office that we couldn't understand who they are, what are they doing, but people were drawing salaries on a monthly mm. basis. Mm. We then investigated, we realized that these are party affiliates who were brand chairperson and secretaries and all of that. And we then said, no, we cannot continue. We terminated those contracts mm. because they were not adding value into, sure. into, into what we wanted tell to do. Tell us about the residents as well, because I think what you did there was quite Come to that. So sure. we, we then realized that we had some serious savings. So 
When I came in, they told me, well, Mayor, you have now a residence, um, uh, you know, mentioned that you can go and live in. I went and looked at it. I said, but why should I leave my own house that is comfortable and come and live um, somewhere where we have millions of people that are still need, um, in need of a house? or in need of a shelter. So we then said, uh, yeah, I then said to the team, sell this house. We took that money, 45 families are benefiting. Houses for 45 families out of a sale of one house. Sure. And that was also the proceeds of um, corrupt activities. So that house, they bought that house a number of years back and spent 11 million rand to renovate mm. the house. But that house could not even collect 5 million rand or 5.5 million rand in the market. Mm. That tells you that money didn't actually go into the renovation of mm. the house. Mm. Money went somewhere else. Yeah. Yeah. So the other thing they came and said, well, Mayor, we have 14 uh, brand new BMWs outside um, that you and your mayoral committee can use. I said, I don't need that. Let's use the same old vehicles that are available. Take the same vehicles. We started Africa's first anti hijack owned by municipality. So you have an anti hijack unit that is owned by the municipality. Sure. That sure. is able to then serve the people. That's when you have leadership that is focusing on serving the people and making people's lives better. No, absolutely, and I think it's, it's, it's really commendable, particularly even just the symbolic steps of yeah. doing that are, are something that I think we, we need to encourage in all our politicians across the board. And yeah. so I think that's great. But I want to also um, ask some, some, maybe some tougher questions. Yeah. Um, someone who has been reported to be your brother in Kululeko, yeah, yeah. um, I saw today yeah. uh, just, just a very recent report that the, the police have dropped the case saying there's not enough evidence. Um, but I also saw a report that there may be um, an internal disciplinary inquiry. <laughs> Is he your brother? Did, was there theft? Um, can this be connected or linked to you in any way? All right. You know, the funny thing is that uh, the, the, the ANC release, and you'd realize this is the first time I ever mentioned that name, and probably will be the last time I ever mentioned hmm. that name in this interview, sure. because they've become irrelevant to me and they will continue to be relevant. Sure. And they should be irrelevant to every South African, young South African who see themselves having a brighter future. <laughs> Let me say to you this. So they came and said my brother was arrested. Yeah. I got a shock of my life and I called my brother and he was home, he was chilling, he was actually you know, at home on a Friday afternoon. He says, what are you talking about? Mm. I said, well, you, I'm told that you're arrested. You are currently in jail. He says, I have never been arrested. I'm not arrested. I don't know that I'm about to be arrested. Okay. That's number one. So I said, okay, are you, are you, have you been called for a disciplinary um, inquiry of some kind? He says, in the department, they were told that uh, mm. two computers went missing. Not 100 computers, as mm. um, you know, uh, the Pinocchio uh, was saying. Mm. Um, he said to me, you know, there were two computers that are reported to have been stolen. And there's a few of us that are suspected of that. All right. And then I said, well, look, I mean, if any of you have been involved in wrongdoing, there's nothing that... Uh, um, you know, anybody can do in protecting you. I don't think any of us um, in the family here knows. We've never been raised, um, you know, to be thieves. We've never been raised to cut corners in mm. getting what we want to mm. achieve in life. And I said, if that is the case, I'm not going to stand up for you. He says, no, well, there's no need for you to do that. Yeah. And I released a statement that same evening. A, my brother was hired a year before I was even elected into office. My brother, Swan's own um, HR uh, document will show you that my brother was hired a year in 2015, okay. and we were only elected late 2016. That's number one. Mm. Number two, Twani has never reported any in given time that it lost 100 computers. Pinocchio said that uh, they've lost 100 uh, uh, computers in a space of two days. Twani has never lost two compute, um, um, computers in that space. Okay. They said that uh, you know they have full evidence and that uh, the police must investigate this thoroughly and they are going to submit any mm. you know documents. And the police said, well, we're waiting for those documents. Nothing was ever forthcoming. Yeah. So nothing ever was ever submitted to then sub, uh, to then uh, you know suggest that uh, there is a case mm. to be answered. And then it went on to then say that uh, my brother needs to be checked in terms of the qualification. And I can tell you right now, he's qualified to do the job that he is doing. Mm -hmm. So um, the conclusion that I could come up out of that is that here are desperate people who are seeing a campaign that is moving, that is not theirs. And the best thing that they can do is to then throw a spanner in the works and create stories of saying that, uh, you know, people, uh, you know, hired, I've hired uh, my own family members over and above there. They're not qualified. There's 100 computers. And I said, well, sure. if you have a case, 
Stop running, jumping up and down into the media space and into social media. Go and report it. Go and report it. The police came and said, well, this was open, but there was no evidence whatsoever mm. to mm. say that uh, this man has done it. So you and can I reassure said, us that, that, you know, also, and, and honestly, we live in a country where, you know, there, there's so much happening. We, we can't yeah. necessarily control yeah. what our siblings do yeah. all the time. And, and, and that's also fair, you know. Um, let's say even if you haven't seen anything, something like that came out. Because there are lots of politicians who may yeah. be similar. How would you approach that? Um, and if there, if there was, or even in the future, if there is any wrongdoing with people close to you, because you're a powerful person and, and people might you know, try and exploit that power, how, how, do you, how can you reassure people that you would take those difficult decisions? I can tell you right now, even before I knew that the cops, there was a case opened, when I had that statement, I came out. I didn't hide and say, mm. my brother this, my brother that. I said, if my brother has done anything wrong, he should full, face the full might of the law. Sure. And that's how we need to be treating it. I'm not going to sit and say, my son didn't do like the two presidents that I know. Mm -hmm. My son having been involved in this and that, and then it turns out that your son has been involved. And you say, but well, I am trying to explain it away. Mm. No. If we are, um, you know, to build a society where people are supposed to take individual responsibility of their action, then I should then be able to then say, if my brother has done wrong, he should then be able to then face the consequences of his action. And that's how it should be. So I want to come on to one, one final area um, where the DA has been criticized. Yeah. Um, your, I think it's your chairperson of the federal council is a white man. Right. The deputy chairperson of the federal council white man right other deputy chairperson white man there's some now other there's a woman that's mazzoni isn't it yes but there's that's also a lady michael waters and we have refile um Nseke, a black no, no, lady that, that's fine i'm just right. saying no no you know of, what i'm trying on, to get to wait, wait, okay. let me finish the question of the 11 top elected leaders right i think six are white south africans one is a woman five are, are men are you doing enough at the top levels of your party to transform so that your party doesn't fall victim to the stereotype about the DA? All right. Um, the DA has been the only party in government, and that is the official um, opposition party, that has had a female leader, for a very successful female leader, who was a mayor, who was the premier, and who then was the leader of the party. We also have we don't do bean counting, how many blacks, how many whites, how many this, how many that. We say people must contest. You have Musi, who's a black man, who was elected by black, white, Indian, colored people. Yeah. You have Rafil and Seke, who was elected black, white, Indian, colored. You have Mazoni, who was elected black, white, Indian, colored. Yeah. You have James Self, who was elected. Um, Thomas Waters, who was elected. Uh, Mike Waters, who was elected. Now, the moment you start wanting to do bean counting, then you are making an organization a rigid organization. I think if you start talking about democracy, that's when we practice what we preach. We're not saying, look at this person and say, we need to have so many black people, we need to have so many white people. That's why we're, only, we're the only party that talks about diversity and practice it. Why would you ask that same question to the EFF? Tell me of a white leader that you know of the EFF. Well, or even the ANC. Tell me of a white leader that you know of the ANC. So, so I'm saying to you. But, but no, but let me, let me answer the question. Right. I think on, on the one hand, if other political parties are also failing, then those questions should be put to those parties. But we're but not it, failing. It doesn't mean, well, the question of South Africa's historical right. situation would, would suggest that if you have a preponderance of white men right, at the right. top levels of your party, right. There's something, and, and you come from a history of, right. of where you come from, something isn't changing fast enough. And it's not my perception, yeah, yeah. it's a widespread one. And the question is, are you doing enough to convince people that if you take over Gauteng, yeah. you know, the question of transformation will matter. Yeah. And, and you will ensure that those people who deserve to be in top leadership positions right. will be from right. all races. I challenge you to go and look at the list that are submitted by all parties because it's public knowledge right now. Go to the IEC, you're able to then see that. I challenge you, you will never, ever, ever, ever see a party that has got diverse candidates than the DA has. Yes. 
So we're not, we not, we not just saying this. We are practicing what we are saying. We are a party that has been able to put an Indian next to a black man, next to an Africana person, next to a, 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 a colored person, and say you can coexist in a political party. And this is why when we're talking about building one South Africa for all, we really mean it. We really mean it and we practice it. And this is why our party is the only party that you go to every province, you find that people are able to jump from this area to that area to that area. Other parties are not able to do that. The only time they're able to do that is when they have Cyril Ramaphosa, you know, flogging along. The only time they're able to do that is when they have Julius Malema flogging along. So we are saying we are building a party that has a diverse and talented group of leaders, and I must say young leaders as well, who we are able to then send all over to go and do campaigning. Look, here in Gauteng, mm. who's, I'm the premier candidate, and sure. the party has put up its hand and say, we are going to put this man, because as a young person, well, I'm not even 40, so I still think myself as yeah. young. Yeah. Um, yeah. As a young person, we have faith in him. <laughs> we are going to put him up. But over and above that, we challenge other political parties to tell us who they're going to put up. And in the Free State, in the Northern Cape, in the Western Cape, in Pumalanga, Limpopo, you name it, we have done that. We have put up people to say, these are credible leaders that we can rally behind as an organization, diverse, Indian, black, white, colored. We are able to then put that. Tell me of any other party that can claim that. Well, thank you for fielding our questions hard and some nice, you have to admit. <laughs> and uh, thanks so much for joining us on SMWX. We really appreciate you addressing us and addressing the young people who care about what you have to say. Thank you very much. I think I, was, I must say to the young people, the future is in your hands. Yeah. Staying away from voting is not going to help you. Mm -hmm. Staying away from voting means that you are still voting for things to remain as they are. Yeah. It's your chance right now. This, I take this election as a referendum. Mm -hmm. You can then choose to have some of the same or you can choose to have a future where you have a say, a future where you belong. And on the 8th, you have an opportunity to really put a government in place that will put you first, that will make sure that South Africa is working both, um, you know, um, figuratively and literally as well. Thank you very much. Thanks for tuning in. We'll have more bonus content and questions from our audience when we come back. Spread the fire. I hear you. SMWX. No young people are around the decision-making table. Let some new voices come to the fore. Follow us on WhatsApp and catch us live Tuesdays and Thursdays. Out with the old, in with the new. SMWX.